Welcome to Kicking It with Grant Mahoney and Jeff Woody. Last week we started out with a very sassy, like a very sarcastic, sassy opening about everything being worthless. Not sarcastic anymore. Shit's Not real. sarcastic anymore. Uh, so <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if this is just gonna be like a perennial thing, but like there's a chance that there might be some profanities uh, thrown about. Not anything serious, but like some S's, some D's, some some darns. Uh, so if you have kids in the car and you really don't want them to hear some profanity, I mean, you might want to just sit this one out, but I think we're all feeling it. So I'm just, you know, say the quiet part out loud. Uh, some bullshit happened on Saturday. Iowa State loses 10 to seven at Ohio. We're going to get a lot into that. We're going to spend a little bit of time going over, uh, Oklahoma state, but not a ton because there's a lot that has to talk about. Cause it really doesn't matter what Oklahoma state does. Like there, there's some that it matters. You know, obviously if, Texas or Georgia come to town this week, then that's not great. But you have a team that you can beat in Oklahoma State. But really, it just comes down to what Iowa State's doing. But before we get into anything, I'm going to thank the sponsors. So as always, we're brought uh, brought to you in the Wild Rose Casino and Resort Studios. Um, we, there's NBA Jam going on. So if you're watching the video of this at all and you see my eyes just like go to the right, to my right, uh, it's because I'm watching the potentially the greatest sports video game of all time just the like the real going and i'm sorry grant if i'm i'm gonna try and pay attention i don't but blame it, man I'm, i've got a black corner so you got I'm, a dartboard I'm looking at felt <laughs> um uh anyway the the we're the primary sponsor is Keldrum manufacturing as we've talked about before they are it is getting to be harvest season it's also getting to be potential snowbird season so if you are a snowbird and you got yourself potentially a trailer that you're going to take down like a camper and you need to get some work done on Anything that's mechanically sound, or excuse me, like the, the structure of that, you need to get some altering, uh, lifting done, work on working on something like that. Calder Manufacturing is going to be able to put something together for you. So the original down corn reel, 1977, does both down and up corn, but also great cyclones, cyclones, up and cyclones. So Grant, uh, how was your game that you watched on Saturday? How was that game watch experience for you? Hmm. I cracked a beer early. <laughs> and then another one. Mm-hmm. And another one. I mean, <clears throat> how many times have you heard this over? I mean, I'm sure people are yelling it when I was playing, when we were playing. Make your kicks, you win the game. If we made our kicks, we would have won the game. This is, it's Kansas from last year, but this year. That's the 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 thing that I think everyone has like this latest, greatest, or in this case, latest worst, that the recency bias says that this is the worst thing that's ever happened. Now, this is pretty damn bad. Like, we're not, let us not sugarcoat this at all. And this is one of the worst offensive outputs that I have seen in a while. And uh, there are ways that you can address it, and we're going to get into that. But this is, you have an incapacity to run the ball. You have a quarterback who's actually throwing it okay. I think Rocco's game against Ohio was better than... uh, Deckers against Kansas. I think there's less turnovers, less mistakes. I think I think I think Rocco had a, a, a Rocco good game. played solid, and the dude was sicker than a dog. Oh yeah, he was puking at halftime, puking before the game, puking at halftime. Um, but the the game against Kansas last year, it was running backs because you're down, you were down Jirel, you were down Cartavius, you were playing Eli Sanders and uh, twenty two. Forget his name, um, Deion Silas. Deion Silas and couldn't run the ball and therefore you couldn't move the ball on a defense that you probably should. You also miss all the kicks and not, if you make them, despite how bad you're playing, you still have the capacity to win the game. So we'll get, because this is special teams, we're going to get the special teams part out because honestly, special teams on mass wasn't terrible, but the field goal execution was really bad. What happened on the two missed field goals because everyone saw the second one, but what happened on the first missed field goal into the second missed field goal? Yeah, I watched the first one back uh, multiple times and I, I saw it live. And once again, the long snapper, it wasn't as bad this time as I think last game. He did not hit Perkins in the frame of his body. Perkins had to lean forward. Fr- Define frame the body. So from your body, so if you're to your shoulders down to your hips. To your hips, yeah, I mean. He was per- kind of squatted, but. Per- yeah, per- Perkins has his, his body, you know, when he's asking for the ball, he's turning his chest, kind of facing the... The long, snapper. The, yeah, facing the long his snapper. ass. Yeah, 
to, chest to, 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 get, to get from a target. Yeah. To get from a target. Hit, hit me the numbers. I want you to snap it to me. He should be hitting him like he's a receiver catching the ball at his numbers. He didn't. This time again, he caused Perkins to go outside it's of his towards, frame. So he's snapping towards the kicker as opposed to towards the snapper or towards the holder. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so that caused Perkins to place the ball. He missed his spot about, by about three inches. Um, and what I mean by his spot is he's got his left hand down. His right hand is up at the long snapper. His left hand down is signaling where Contreras wants the ball placed. It's basically, to take the golf example, it's where the T is yep. on the drive, or on, on the, the tee box. And there's no ball there, but there's a tee there. So you would presume that the ball is going to be on top of the tee. So that's the spot that he, that Contreras is looking at. And some, some holders will even pull up some um, turf or grass that, that's painted white and set it there. So then the kicker can keep their eyes focused on that spot, even when the holder lifts their hand up to catch the ball, because that's that's the kicker's go. So Pro when, tip. Yep. Pro tip. Yep. So when, when the holder lifts his left hand up to go catch the ball with both hands, the kicker should still be looking at that spot, knowing that, okay, when I when I go to plant, boom, I'm swinging through. That's where the ball should be. The ball was not placed there. Not on Perkins. I mean, he, he did what he could. He grabbed the ball and put it down the best he could, but he did miss his spot by about three inches. And I felt like Contreras might have left his um, left his hips open a little bit. Just because he's, I mean, the ball's off spot. So mm-hmm. operation's just not good. Whether that's, I mean, the yeah. snap wasn't great. The hold tried to fix it, couldn't get it all the way fixed. Uh, and then the kick mechanically because of all those things happening wasn't great this is the third this is the third bad snap we've seen on bad field. operations bad operations we've seen um so far this season and i'm not sure if iowa state's doing i know in the past campbell has done he's had one long snapper for punts and one long snapper for field goals because it is different punts is about 15 yards back field goals are about seven eight yards back and you're trying to shoot it in very different spots yep so um but yeah missed that one and then the second one um it looked like he left his tips open and it was over the upright. It sucks because the rule is if the upright goes to outer space, if the ball is over the upright and not completely inside the upright, it's no good. It's non-reviewable. Because uh, the theory on that, and it's it's you can say that it's a bullshit rule, but like the theory is is if it's o- directly over the upright, if you mentioned like if the upright goes all the way to space, well, it would hit the upright unless it's completely inside of it. It would doink off the upright just that uh, five stories off the ground. So it's it's dumb and you don't know where that that doink would have gone it looked like it was towards the inside of that imaginary goal post but at the end of the day don't leave it to a field goal right to be necessary especially from that distance it shouldn't be that close put it down the middle i mean don't don't even flirt with the upright yeah as, as, as coach schwartz would say don't flirt with the upright just put it down the middle and it didn't even seem like it was that uh like it was it was that windy like the conditions didn't feel all that bad so i think it, it just feels like he's sort of in his head I think I think we're in the thick of it now. I mean, I, I talked about, you know, he's gone through some adversity first two games. We are in adver- – how does he bounce back? We are in adversity. He has – I'm sure he's in his own head. And that applies to the snapper too. It does, absolutely. And and um, you can take all the, all the reps you want and practice all the mental reps you want, but it's going to take the next live field goal, PAT, whatever it is, for it to be a perfect execution until they're like, okay, we're, you know – we're good to go. You know, got that monkey ever back. We're, we're back on track. Um, but, I mean, we've, we've seen three bad operations so far. And and it's not cold yet. And it's not cold yet. And who knows what the next field goal will happen. So we'll see. We'll see what happens on the next field goal. So I the other thing, just general special teams things, um, hidden yardage. The, the guess that hidden yardage. So hidden yardage, we are excluding one. You know, the same thing, the kneel down drive, excluding where that came from, that last, the very last pick at the end of the game. Which was bullshit. That, that was, was P.I. That was, I, the thing that, that I will come to on that, and uh, shout out to Zach Spears, who, teammate of ours, he's actually refereeing, he's a referee now, like refereeing Juco games, um, like D3 games, high school games, he's a referee down in Dallas. Does he want to ref Big 12 games? No. <laughs> he, he could, Jeez. he could. Uh, but generally, like, the plays that are impossible to actually, you know, uh, to to call are the bang bang. Did he get there a half a count early? Yeah, probably. But like live, it looked bad. But if he got there way early and it bounces off the top of Higgins' head, then yeah, it's really clearly that. But it kind of it still hit him kind of sort of around the hands. He was just getting blown forward. So like yeah, he got there a little bit early. And then also it's just that's shit luck. Like the ball went back to a fat guy, turned around, and caught it. 
Lyman's dream, too. Absolute dream. Did you see, speaking of, did you see in the Chiefs game when Mahomes? <laughs> so Mahomes is scrambling around, and I don't remember, I think it's number 79, whoever the left tackle is that. for the Chiefs. He caught it and froze. Like, <laughs> he caught it and froze. What like, do I do with this? Well, this play is dead anyway. That was so. just one chance <laughs> to make a play. Just go he, for it, buddy. He had no idea what to do. And then, did you watch the, the, did you watch the, the end of the Patriots-Dolphins game? Yes. Okay, we need to put in a rule. Aiden text me that. Well, we're talking the play where the lineman caught it. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Which, okay, side up, brilliant. Absolute brilliant football by, I think, Gasicki was the one that caught it, or Henry, whoever it was. Gesicki, brilliant. Yeah. It's fourth down. It doesn't matter. If you they, if they return a fumble for a touchdown, then it's they you lose anyway. If you get stopped short, you lose anyway. Just throw it. Like, I did that. There's a Kansas State game, one of the two fumbles I've had in my life. Uh, one of them was... In the Kansas State game, we're down by like four, where it's like fourth and four. There's backside pressure. We run the ball. I'm getting tackled. I just huck it over my shoulder. Like, we lose anyway if we get tackled. Brilliant football. Anyway, tight end pitches it to the offensive line. What's the rule change? If a play is cool enough, it should count. <laughs> I, I love it. Do you it. remember that Thursday night game a couple years ago where it happened to a Dolphins, a Dolphins player, I think? Where I don't remember who the quarterback was for the Dolphins at the time, but the ball got deflected or something. And somehow an offensive lineman ended up with it, and they dove and like had oh a yeah back but, reach. But I th- technically, it, it must was, have been like an el- ineligible receiver yeah, or something, an so, el- illegal touching or an yeah. eligible downfield or something like that. So but it like, didn't count. But if it's cool enough, it counts. <laughs> yes. Just give it to fat guys. Give yes. more. I mean, give it to more fat guys. One of the best plays in NFL history. Who's and that? Patriots. Dan guy? Connolly. Dan Connolly. Dan yes. Connolly with the the. He, I remember watching that game live, being like, "No way! No way!" No. And it's just, I mean, guys playing up back, which one, if you're an up back, an offensive lineman playing up back, you're already athletic. Like you got to move in space to be able to play that position. And he catches a ground ball and about houses the whole thing. And I'm losing it because I'm team offensive lineman all the time. Gave her the old Jeff Woody. Tuck that thing <laughs> in your gut. <laughs> not, Don't not, anyone not the Jeff Woody. The Scott Houghton at uh, Missouri. Oh, yeah, yeah. Big man touchdown. Scott Houghton, he also, he could throw the ball farther than anybody on the team he could stand on the hoop and dunk and he was like 6'2 330 he's more than big than 6'2 but he was yeah. every bit of 330 as an athletic athlete. human athletic human um we're talking about special teams well well while we are talking about special teams brilliant play and aiden text me this in the patriots dolphins game having the guy get a running start from the edge i mean you got to time that up perfectly and he did well he's timing it on the kicker's motion because it wasn't on the, the holder. actual the holder yeah the holder's motion so you watch enough film like the holder's motion was the same. So as soon as his hand goes up, I'm sure there's a thousand, one thousand, two count that the center is going to have to get his head back up so he doesn't get his neck snapped off. And just as soon as his hand goes up, you're taken off. That was one thing, too, that I always made sure I told my holder before the game. Like, you say, T10, T10, hit my holder and my snapper. Like, don't snap it right when they say that because the defense is going to tee off on that. Uh-huh. Hold it for a second, snap it right away, hold it for two seconds. Well, Dakota was also your whole snapper who's... Terrific. Shout what out, what would we have? What would, what would we do to be able to have Gray Mountain back? I'm, I don't know how much eligibility Dakota Zimmerman has. Anyway, uh, so one of the statistics that we've done over the last few weeks is hidden yardage. And not going to explain necessarily hidden yardage anymore. Go back and listen to the first 20 minutes, the last three shows. Uh, what do you think the hidden yardage statistic was? Guess that hidden yardage. We're removing one that we're removing the interception, the kneel down. So the very last drive of the game because Ohio is not attempting to move the ball at all. So, I mean, statistics, you, you technically should also remove like the lost rushing yards from them kind of holding the ball. Uh, but what do you think hidden yardage was? So total yardage, we had 271. Iowa State had 271. Ohio had 247. And they probably lost 30 yards on that drive. So it would have been 300-ish. I mean... I can't shout out Tyler Perkins enough for this statistic. I'm going to say that Iowa State was, uh, I'm going to say Ohio had plus 80 yards. Aiden? I was going to go the opposite. Say Iowa State was like plus 60, plus 70. It's basically a push. It was really Iowa State by five. Hmm. So average yards was almost identical. They each team uh, had just about 240 yards of hidden yardage, basically distance away from the end, the end zone when you start. And that also includes Ohio starting one drive on like the plus 30 after the interception. So 
if you talk, I mean, it's not a special teams play, but you can still, it's still average field position. You have to include it. But the, the special teams wise outside of the missed field goals, outside of the operations, special teams has been better. The special teams is good. The defense, super, super solid. The offense, hot garbage. I mean, it, it's like watching the, that game offensively. It's like watching two turtles fight over a nut. Like that was just, that was, it was so frustrating to watch. Not necessarily frustrating to watch the defense because it, there were a couple annoying plays where Rourke would, I mean, to his credit, understand that if they're playing either a combination man zone where a lot of the zone, you're the zone eyes or the deep safeties, they're probably not going to get to you by the time you're rushing. If you're scrambling to get it, if there's man to that side, that means the defenders are going to have their backs to you. So just take off. If you need seven yards, get seven yards, get out of bounds. I mean, that was their best. That was either team's best running game. Neither one could run the ball. And Caden Rourke, or is Caden Rourke? Whoever, Rourke. Uh, I think Curtis. Curtis Rourke. Uh, is, was his brother Caden? I don't know. Either way, Rourke, quarterback. His, the scrambling that he had was sometimes frustrating in that it was a, they were allowing plays. And then also the miscommunication for the touchdown where uh, it was either Will McLaughlin or Bo Freeler who was supposed to take number three and it continue that. But I don't know what the, what the scheme was, but Bo was on the guy. And then as soon as he broke... He went for whoever whoever became number. It was right. it was a whip route for it was the number two receiver was the one that ran essentially a back of the end zone and number three ran a whip to it. So Bo sat down on that or whoever somebody was supposed to carry number two to the back end the back of the end zone. They didn't. You can't expect a team to be perfect. You you cannot expect the defense to hold the team out of the end zone the entire game and also from the thirty yard line when they've been on the field. I think at that point the time of possession was like twenty one to ten. Like it was not close and or whatever I don't know whatever time in the game it was but it was a substantial time of possession difference so the thing that the obvious story of the game offense was dog shit and I think you know to say that that the offense was dog shit is not me like projecting some weird opinion Matt Campbell called it embarrassing if Matt Campbell comes out and calls something embarrassing especially this season when he's trying to it feels like he's trying to be uh pretty protective of the the emotions kind of the confidence of the rest of the team of like you know coming out against the, the image I, of the team and but i think more he's using the media to talk to guys like uh if it was you know last week when he says the best that we played against iowa and in my time here well, i mean might have been probably wasn't but he's trying to project and instill confidence in his guys and you know that that sort of thing this is a very different tactic and he might have just been you know, he he got in that little little pissing match with the fan on the way by, which bad luck, but I I get it. He's human. But also <laughs> that guy. For real. Like the the guy One, who's that guy for saying it, but two, who wears band aids under their eyes like that? A, a grown <laughs> man? You're not Nelly. Don't you can't do that. I and I understand that like there is there's the intent. I mean to be to be serious, like you're mad too. But and I get that the point the 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 concept of like what Campbell is saying when he kind of first got here is raising the standard. Yes, that the standard has sufficiently been raised, and this is point proven that the standard has been raised. If you're getting so mad about a loss that you're chirping at the coach to a game that you traveled to, that is where the expectations are much higher than they have been, which is a good thing. Like ultimately, you expect to win the games that you're in, pretty much every single one of them. However. Uh, I don't think that like the guy who's doing the chirping, I don't think he recognizes how mad everybody in that locker room already is. I mean, it's, it's the, uh, it's sort of the same. I, I mean, not necessarily to the same degree, but like, imagine you're at a, uh, you know, a, a, a wedding or something like that. And someone spills wine on the mother of the bride or something like that. And then someone comes out of the blue and is like, Hey, you dumb mofo, how dare you? Like, do you think that person wanted to do that? They already feel bad about themselves. You don't have to make them feel worse. Now, this take that times 10 because it's a competitive event. These people are super competitive. They lost. Now you're chirping at a guy who's already on edge. Like, that is, I mean, if you want, the, the reason that Campbell said that he came, whether it's an apocryphal story, I don't know, is because the fan support existed around the game. And now that dude is chirping at that coach who has done more for this program than other basically anybody except Dan McCarney. Like I would say is is as 
useful to this program and you're trooping at that dude because you got your feelings hurt at a game. Yeah, and that and that douchebag looks bad because there are so many fans who are behind Campbell, but yet that idiot's response is what's going to be floating around Campbell's head of, well, you know, I'm sure he's not thinking, am I in the hot seat? But it just sucks that, yeah. And at the, at the same time, now let's not necessarily excuse the fact that it was an unacceptable performance. It was. You should, ex- it, they should be better in year eight than they are right now, especially because everything that had gone into the last 12 months was to make this exact situation not happen. You hire a new strength coach. You hire a new offensive line coach. You fire one of your best friends in Tom Manning. Literally, was he, I think he was the best man in Campbell's wedding. You fire your best friend because you get a new offensive coordinator. And that, I mean, Jeff Myers has been with him, I think, since Toledo, or at least a super he, long time. He, he played under Campbell. Yeah, so you have guys that you have a long-standing relationship with, and you get rid of a strength coach to bring in people to make a bigger, faster, more physical offensive line. You recruit five tight ends, or you have five tight ends on the right. You recruit to this exact situation to be able to push around teams, to run a physical style offense, and then you can't. That is a huge miss. That is a tremendous miss. So the two things can exist at the same time, where fans can can be unhappy, and you should be. Like I'm unhappy. But you also can be not a dickhead. At yeah. the same time, I I think too. I mean, just look, just watching the game, it it, and I I you know I'm not gonna lie. There were times that you know when when we were playing, we'd go to, oh who was it? I can't remember who it was. We we played we played a MAC team. Um, it was your, it would have been your first year. It it broke the the longest road losing streak. I don't remember which one it was. Ugh. Anyways, we played the MAC team, and we just I think we it was had, Kent State, right? Kent State, yep. Yeah. Was that Julian which, Edelman, or was that after? Julian it was Julian a year Edelman? after him. Okay. Which, which side note? Maybe this is just me being stupid. I didn't realize at the time. I didn't realize Kent State was in Ohio, and I thought we were going to Kentucky. I thought it was Kentucky State. <laughs> so we landed in Ohio. I'm like, what are we doing in Ohio? I was like, I was like, what? Kent State's in Ohio. But that game, we just showed up, thinking, okay, we're a Big Twelve team. We're gonna, we're gonna beat these guys, and we did. And I think that's what the team thought. This last Saturday was, man, we're Big 12. We're going to show up, just show up and beat these guys. We beat them 43 to 10 last year. And uh, we looked like booty cheeks that, you know, on Saturday. And Rourke was, I mean, some people think that Campbell and, and Haycock were saying that Rourke is the best quarterback we were, were facing to ooh, take a jab at Iowa. He, I felt like it was the best quarterback we have faced thus far this year. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a fine player, but at the same time, uh, a defense did their job. But like, I don't, I mean, there are, there's going to be times when offensive talent is so high and I don't, you know, the, the one that comes to mind is Texas, but it's also going to be cold and who knows what's going to be happened by that point. Uh, so there's going to be times when offensive talent really overwhelms, uh, you know, it gives the capacity for a team to, to succeed super well. But this defense is so consistent and good and physical and disciplined that it's not really going to make much of a difference who they're playing. Uh, I, and the, another thing that just I I kind of want to address from sort of like the player's standpoint is like the food poisoning thing or the nor, the Nova virus, Norovirus, whatever it was, Norovirus, yeah. where you get a I mean you get a bug and that sucks, but also like I've small business owner like I've had the shits and had to go to work like and no one needs no one cares you know I I don't I don't mean to sound that coarse but like. Uh, Jeremiah George literally shit his pants on the field. Well, Nebraska, t- two thousand nine. Oh yeah, Nebraska in two thousand nine. We, were, we I, thought I, we thought our nod. We were without Alexander Robinson. Uh, Half ben, the offensive line. Ben Lamock was out on two of my field goals that Dominican Sue blocked. And we, we, had, we had guys puking literally mid play while they're at the. Uh, I mean, yeah. I texted a buddy. And I was like, I was like, okay. I mean, you know, when, when I when I heard that we had guys out because of uh, you know what we thought was food poisoning. I was like, all right, Nebraska, a la, you know, 2009. And that, that, that's why I want to shout out Rocket back again. He was, he was puking, like you said, puking at halftime, and I thought he played well. You know, he he played for the first three quarters. Iowa State felt like, you know, ah, we'll just show up and win, and and we weren't. Mm-hmm. You know, Iowa State wasn't winning. And then Rocco, I think, felt like in the fourth quarter, we can't run the ball. I'm going to do what I can to win. I can throw the ball, and when it's not there, I'm going to run the ball. And I hope you see more of that Rocco, of, of fourth quarter Rocco, um, healthy and not puking his brains out. But – 
assertive than than we see passive Rocco um yeah not tucked and running not yeah. pulling the ball when he right. should but I'm just saying like the the food poisoning thing like it sucks but if you are if you're gonna go out and play right play play like if and I so a guy like Jalen Noel like if if you literally don't have the energy to run around that sucks but you know and like the, if then then sit which is the, the next, I mean, next man up next man, again same thing like Arnaud was he wasn't able to play because he was so ill during that game, you had to have somebody there. Somebody else has to step up. I thought Dimitri Stanley did a fine job filling in for the most part and playing the position that Jalen Noll did. So Daniel Jackson, he had a good game. Right. And so if you have guys, if there are people behind you and they, you're not well enough to play, then sit and have somebody else take your spot for that game. But if you're going to go out and play, play. I don't give a shit. They don't give Oklahoma, Ohio doesn't give a shit that you're sick. They're not going to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, buddy. Let me take Let me. Okay. I'll take it easy on you. Yeah, take it easy you're on not, you. Your tummy's upset. I'll take it easy. I don't if, care. If you are good and if you are well enough to play, you must play at the at the highest possible level. And that's what Rocco did. You know, again, I, I think Rocco he was the best offensive player. Um, I would say on I don't know if I'm going to say necessarily on either team, but Rocco played exceptionally well. But now that we kind of like transition towards the offense itself, um, there are some fundamental two two fundamental things need to happen. One of two things. Thing number one is there are there is clearly a misalignment of the scheme that is being run and the capacity, the current capacity of the players on the field to run it. Which is annoying because Campbell's thing is players, formations, plays. Right. So and you I say a round peg square hole, which right. is exactly. So if you're if you have a, a misalignment of formation into players actually executing it, you either have to change the players that are playing and whether that be by improvement of performance or by as what Shane would say or Shane Burnham would say fire him so you're either going to get fired and get somebody else in there or improve your play you either have to improve the play of the players or improve the scheme change the scheme to match what the players have the capacity to do so currently the way that Iowa State runs the runs their offense is they liked at least in the first three quarters of the game and then when they kind of opened it up, it was different. And the, the, the primary goal is when you play those three tight end sets, what you're trying to get is you're trying to get these little running lanes that exist in inside of traffic. And what that's going to provide for is if it's blocked correctly, you have more mass and more bodies. And because there's like nine dudes that are going to be potential blockers, you have the capacity to insert a fullback tight end, whatever, into whatever formation you want to say, we think we can access the, if if number 53 is playing defensive tackle, we think we can run at number 53. So you can formation a way really easily with, with having, you know, those tight end trades. You have unbalanced tight end sets. You have three tight ends. You motion a guy from a wide receiver position in. You have a lot of those ways to get, we want to run at number 53. Well, let's get, a, let's get our our guard on number 53 and let's make sure that we can get a, a combo block off of 53 really move him out of the way and you have a lot of ways to work angles inside of there the downside on that is that it brings a lot of bodies into the picture in the running game which if you got a guy like a Brees or got a guy like montgomery who has senior level like really high level understanding of what football is you can help deliver those people linebackers safeties all the people that are added into the box because of the tight ends you can move them where you want to because the way that I describe it is like when I if I've if I'm talking to young running backs and you just hold the football and you say how many tackles can you make without touching this touching the person carrying this zero how many touchdowns can you score without this thing zero how many interceptions can you get without this thing everything on the field focuses around the football you as the running back have it they just give it to you and you say go do something so everyone is trying to get to you. There are rules with how they get to you. You exploit them. You That's what Brees does so well is that he's going to run at you know, 50% pace or maybe 70% pace and make the linebacker think that he's going outside and then that allows the guard to come off and get a combo block on him. Or maybe he really sees an angle and it doesn't matter and he's just going to take off. And he's, so he's going to mess with the rules that defenses play because as the ball carrier... I control everything. I am the maestro of this field. Like that's the way, at least, I don't know. I never played quarterback, but that's the way that I would feel is that think about is I have, you want what I have and I'm going to make you, I'm going to do, I'm going to pull the strings on this. 
And the running backs right now, they're very young and they're trying to get a feel for that. They're not terrible at it. But the downside on this is because there are so many bodies and there's a lot of people to get to, the offensive line's combinations that you would be setting up if you're a running back are awful. That's the biggest thing that has been bad is that the combinations have been like, like Bruns. I think Aiden, you talked to Ben about it and he was talking about how, uh, when you're trying to, if you're trying to block, you have to hang a little bit longer. You have to put more of a body into somebody. I actually, I think the play that Ben brought up was one that I literally was screaming at my TV because Simmons. So Simmons was playing left guard. Neil was playing left tackle. They were trying to run a stretch zone to the right, meaning everybody needs to go to the right. Well, the defensive lineman is lined up to Neil's right. Well, Maestro with the football, the running back goes right, and the guy's already to your right. How are you going to get in front of him? You're not. So you need your buddy who's inside of him to give him a little shoulder check, to like slow him down, to let you get in front of him. Simmons ripped underneath that guy. He ran around him to get away from that guy, that guy ends up making the tackle in the backfield. If I don't have the time as a running back, or if I don't have the capacity to influence where the linebackers are going to be because I'm getting hit right away, then the whole thing falls apart. So the offensive line, the combo blocks, the offensive line, they are trying to get off way too fast to get to the second level, to get to whomever else they need to combo to, or they're not communicating. Long and the short of it is combination blocks are really bad for this offensive line. Second part on this. I don't see any, like the the tight ends, the tight end position. There are a lot of really good athletes. Without Steve O'Klotz, there are not any uh, Sam Seen Buckners in this group where you're going to go and I'm just going to punk a dude. There's no Chase Allens in this group. There are a few guys that might turn out to be more of a Charlie Kohler type. You know, you look at Bramer. You, I think Tyler Moore has a really good future as a, a pass catcher. I mean, he's, he's a, a, a younger guy by playing experience, but an older guy generally. But like, the tight end position, their blocking capacity has not been good either. And that beca- could be because they're young. I'm little glass houses, glass house throwing stones. I wasn't awesome at blocking. Like, especially if I had to go against a, yeah, a big either. defensive. <laughs> if I had to go against a big defensive lineman or a linebacker, uh, it wasn't necessarily usually going to work. Like, I'm that wasn't a skill set of mine. That's why I didn't play a ton of fullback, mostly tailback. Side tangent, sorry. Uh, one of my blocked P, uh, black field goals. And Dominican Sue blocked it and it went to where they Nebraska could recover it. I was so pissed he blocked it. I tried to like like shoulder checked him. Dude didn't move. I was like, damn, damn it, you're really big. He's, I remember watching film because we were uh on the scout team. And so like you were watching film of Nebraska's offense, but you also get to watch like in the team meetings, sort of the scouting film. I remember and Dominican Sue, I actually think it was game film of that game. He ran down Josh Lenz on a tunnel screen. Yes. Dude, Flat, he, he was a, had a motor and he was Good athlete. Crazy. Like on the field. I don't know. I mean, he might be a nice person off the field. Crazy on the field. Uh, I don't think he's that. Meh. I don't know. Off the field, maybe. On the field. I don't know. Uh, NFL, nice NFL has been good for him, yeah. yeah. I don't think stomping on people's ankles is something you should do. Several times. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, continue. But the personnel that they have is the offensive line does not do well with zone blocking execution, especially if the plays are outside, which if you're playing these, if you've got eight dudes in the box and you have technical, quote, leverage, and you're trying to get Abu Sama outside because a dude's a freak with speed, but you're not getting any of the angles actually taken care of because one, your block, your combos suck, and so you're going to have some type of penetration from somebody, whether defensive lineman, whatever. And two is your tight ends aren't physical enough at the point of attack to actually get the angle that you want, to get the edge that you need to be able to get around to the outside. So the solution has to come, like I said, in one of two ways. Either you... Improve the play of the players to the point where they can execute the scheme that you want them to or abandon the scheme. To me, it feels like the better option is option two. So you... Especially if we've been... I mean, if Iowa State's been running the same, you know, super predictable last year, been pretty super predictable this year, scrap it and let's try something new maybe. So now's the time to do it too, going into conference play. We, we still have... You know, Iowa State's still got their goals in front of them. Granted, they probably aren't looking the the brightest, but but who are you scared of in this league? No one looks that good. I mean, Texas Te- Texas, Texas looks, looks good. good. Oklahoma looks fine. They they even look vulnerable against Wyoming. You know, yeah. If they sleepwalk, which they could be again, who knows what the season's going to be when it comes to aim? So there's nobody in this league that you look at and you go, "Whew!" Especially on I would say schedule. That's a tough out, you know. I mean, and so 
going into the Big 12 season, it is possible to still regain some modicum of success and respect. And you actually have a good opportunity with Oklahoma State because their offense is also pretty down and they're going to be playing the best defense that they've played all year. Pretty down. They're, they're worse than Iowa State. Okay, very down. They suck. Uh, they got Gunnar Gundy, though. Yeah. It'd be like Gundy. me. It'd be like me naming my kid like Woodrow. Wood Woody. Wood Woody. <laughs> Woodrow Woody. That's uh. They, they've act, they've they've rotated three quarterbacks. I think Alan Bowman, the former Texas Tech Michigan transfer, is now their quarterback. He has more interceptions thrown one than touchdowns zero so far this year. Um, but they, I mean, a great opportunity for the Clones to get back on. It. And if if Campbell's going to get the team, you know, try to write the ship. Good game to do it against. Yeah, so there is hope for what's going on. But like st- schematically, a couple things come to mind, which it's been said multiple times before. But when Iowa State played at, what was it, T- Toledo when they were whatever, when they were Kent what, State. Kent State. Yes. Is it Kent State? Toledo? Kent State? Anyway, they are playing the MAC. Akron. It was Akron. Akron. That one. There you go. Other Ohio State. I don't school. know what game you're referencing yet. The the Akron game when they the actually game, switched it was the to game the 3 3 5. It was a game where we wore the so, best, hel- Iowa State wore the best helmets they've ever worn and haven't worn them since. So yeah. the, the chrome reds? They were white. White with the chrome red. Yeah, that's what I mean. White with, yeah. with the chrome, like, came to a point in the back. I would say worn once, haven't worn them Clean. since. Clean. And we've worn the freaking bugle since. Well, the bugle is the very next game. Oh, you're right. Dude. What a downgrade. What, what an absolute, like, the best of the best, the worst of the worst. What a downgrade. Uh, but this it, this situation rem, is very reminiscent of that. Very because is. at that point, the defense wasn't... What? I said very is. Very is. Yes, you, it is. You, very much so. Enjoy your movie. Yeah, you too. I, I didn't go to the movie they're not going in the movie i'm at the ticket counter anyway uh so they couldn't the defense couldn't accomplish the goal that they wanted to because they didn't have enough defensive linemen to uh successfully stop the run so they come out with this three three five stack because they have a ton of linebackers you have a ton of safeties that can actually do the job and so you have better players that can fit in situations that otherwise wouldn't exist if you tried to force and just get better at playing a four three and it just it or a four two five so they come out with this defense and it's totally different, but it's only different in the way that it makes, it puts guys in positions where they can succeed and makes success easier to attain. So the offense right now, I don't think, I mean, the pass protection is pretty good. Like they've given up one sack this entire season. And so pass protection, a thing they can handle. You have wide receivers that if you go across the board, they're super tall. They are between Higgins. You have all your tight ends. You've got, uh, Daniel Jackson, who's like 6'2". You have a big physical wide receiver group. You've got guys that can operate in the slot. I think Aiden Bitter had a fine game. Dimitri Stanley had a fine game. There was a couple times when he was, I was screaming at the TV where he was one yard short in a third round, third down route. It was like three or four times. Three well, why, or four why times. Why are you running those routes? <sighs> Just run it one yard past the sticks, please. Uh, anyway, and then Jalen Noll, when he's going to be able to get healthy, you have talent who, you, who can execute. Separately, you have running backs who operate well in space. You put a guy one-on-one with Sama or Norton, eight times out of 10, they're probably going to break that tackle. The problem is, is that they're not getting any open space. They're getting hit in the backfield and they don't have any room. Even if they do have look a quote one-on-one, they got a, got a guy chasing them from their back shoulder. They can't make any moves. Don't so, quite have that. Yeah. Brees or, or Montgomery wiggle. Well, the, if, yeah. And they was, well, they don't have the right, uh, understanding of where to be quite yet because they're all babies and so what can you do to accentuate a big physical wide receiver group a big physical tight end group and running backs that are generally going to operate pretty well in space even though you actually can still hand them off run five wide (laughs) (laughs) close Uh. is when you watch someone like so colorado is the talk of the town and they are, everyone's talking about Colorado. When you watch their offense, they're doing this. They're, they have a, an offensive line that is fine. It's a fine, it, it, I mean, Shadur Sanders, I think in week one against TCU had like six sacks. So it, their offense line is not great, but they're mitigating it because they've got Shadur Sanders who can sling it around and they've got Travis Hunter who can catch and run. You've got other talented wide receivers and you're just trying to get guys in space. And by spreading everything out, you enable the running game to exist because it is easier for a young running back to be one-on-one at the linebacker. It's easier for a an offensive lineman to feel confident in making their combination blocks longer 
when the linebacker they got to get to is 12 yards away versus when you play this really tight, compact set, the, the confidence of an offensive lineman to stay on the combination block is really low because they fear that that linebacker from three yards away is going to get by him. So it, this offense wants to be a more spread out offense. It is the, the way that it's constructed based on what we've seen the last three games, they operate better in space and Rocco's got the capacity to do it. So I, I don't think that it's like throw the baby out with the bathwater, never run the ball again. No, it's just formation yourself into a position where your offensive line can feel more confident with the time that they have on their combination blocks. I've seen some people say like, well, abandon the zone scheme and get to a gap scheme. That's one option. I'm not anti that option. But I also think that in order to run a gap scheme, you have to stay condensed. Like you have to have tight ends around. And by gap scheme, I mean, instead of saying everyone go to the right, it means the guys on the right side of the line are going to block left. And the left guard is going to pull around and kick somebody out. And then you're going to have a fullback lead somewhere. It's not, everyone's not doing the same thing. Zone off. This is a zone offense can still work. And I think that's probably where they could end up, but they have to give the linemen more time to be comfortable enough to do it. You have, excuse me, you have to give running backs more space to be in one-on-ones and you got to let Rocco sling it around like that. His, he is better in a situation where he can read across the field even if we're not talking like throw it down the field, become Baylor circa 2011, but you're not talking about having an offense where you're trying to chuck it down the field 75 times a game. You can play this sort of dink and dunk, which is, it seems like what you would still have time of possession. You would still be able to have 12 play drives. It's just a different way of doing that. You'd still be able to run the ball. You're not by spreading everything out. You're not forfeiting and playing this, you know, like Tennessee does where it's just a play every 25 seconds, but you can make it easier for your guys to operate by spacing everything out, giving the linemen more time, giving the running backs more one-on-ones, and giving Rocco more freedom to survey the field. Yeah, I mean, and I think you know Williams and Bloom kind of talked about it too um, on their Sunday night on their Sunday night pod that I think. I mean, Williams said the same thing that you know it's it's he he kind of referenced you know the the Texas game being a turning point for the the dime stack and now would be a good time for Iowa State to mix it up offensively. Why not? You know, the definition of insanity is, you know, doing things over and over and over and expecting different results and you're getting the same results. Well, yeah, it's, it's not working right now. And especially now with, with a new offensive coaching staff, essentially, aside from uh, Mauser, I think, well, I guess Shields is still there too, but Mauser and Shields, I think are the only two that are still left over from the offensive um, staff from before. Now is a good time to, to to mix it up and try something new. And like we kind of alluded to earlier on, entering Big Twelve play is is a good time to do it. Zero and zero. My question for you, Jeff, is there has been a two part question. There has been a lot of talk about it's Campbell's offense, and then he picks the guy to run it. One, why? I don't think he does that with with Haycock. I think he lets Haycock do his thing. I think, in my opinion, if you are a professional offensive coordinator at the power five level, you should be able to, to run it yourself. So what, why do you think Campbell has that reign over? And two, if we are running the same offense in year eight, I feel like early on in the season, we run an exaggerated eight plays, second game, 10 plays. It's not until the 10th, 11th, 12th game where we're opening up the entire playbook. Why not open the playbook from the get go? Everyone already sees the plays we've run you know, in the, in the past eight years. So, okay. So answer to question number one is I, if I'm Campbell and so trying to put myself in his shoes, he, one of the things that he is very adamant about is complimentary football. And so what I doubt he's doing is saying run, you know, queen left 27 flow, you know, X corner. Like I, I doubt that he's saying that, but what I guess what I would bet he is saying is we need, you know, on this drive, the, 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 you get a turnover and you're saying, take a shot. I need you to take a shot here. Or we need to drain the clock or be physical where run to the right side. We, you know, in whatever, like giving general bumper lanes to operate in because the pro of that would be that he's going back and forth between offense and defense and game planning. And then also in special teams in game planning. So he understands where all the pieces are. And so maybe playing to a punt on a specific drive 
isn't necessarily bad for what he thinks the defense is going to be able to do against the other offense and just win field position on the other side. And when you've got an All-American punter back there. Yeah, Tyler Perkins. Hey, All-American. Uh, beat Tor Taylor. Uh, but the downside on that is that you're st- it feels like you're potentially stifling the creativity of the person underneath you. And that feels like Shieldhouse really hasn't had the opportunity to spread the offense or spread the wings of things that he would like to do because he's essentially saying, let's make sure we get our, you know, going into the staff meeting saying we want to stay with this, you know, three tight ends. We want to make sure if, if more is in the game, we do this. If we want to make sure Bramer's in the game, do this. If we want to have Sama in the game, do this. And and providing sort of the guidelines, but those guidelines are a little more restrictive than what you normally would. Um, if, if by, for whatever reason, if, if Coach Campbell is listening to this, open it up. Let Shieldhouse cook, baby. <laughs> That's my two cents. Let Nate cook. Um, so I think one, the the second part of that question, so, okay, so let me finish the first part, is, yeah, the reason why it, it makes sense because he's the one going back and forth with meetings to, to, to keep the complimentary football stuff tied together. But right now, like I said, it's stifling the creativity of what you can get, what you can have. And it's also, um, it's favoring a child a little bit where uh, kid number one wants to go to the beach on vacation and kid number two wants to go to the mountains on vacation. And we've gone to the beach for five straight vacations. So you're, they're both fine options in that you can choose to go to the beach or the mountains. But kid number two has wanted to go to the mountains for a while. So why not give some more attention and or capacity to do the thing you want to do to that side? So he's played to, his, he's played to the defense a lot in, the, in this formation since the three tight ends thing has happened. It's played very much to the defense, which is good. So now the second th- the second part of that question is uh, with the install over time, why does it take so long to actually open up a playbook? I don't know if that's ne- if that's necessarily true. I in usually it start it's like a, an hourglass where you start out with like a thousand plays and you practice those thousand through spring ball and summer and then you winnow it down to like. 130, I don't know what the total plays. I'm making these numbers up. But for example, you get down like 130 and you try those ones in a game and only 45 of them are successful. So you then pare it down to like 45 that actually work. And then you start implementing tweaks and counters off of those 45, which expands your playbook out now to like 120 new plays that are different based on the lattice that those successful plays provide to you. So it starts out with a ton of them. You just don't remember like, oh, what's the route combination? If we're, are we running sail and a, a sail on the right side with a hitch and we're running on the other side, we're going to run a dig and a post? Are we doing that? Well, we got a sack. So I don't know what the route combination was. Man, and so, that's why I'm glad I was a kicker, man. I had, I had th- three plays to know. <laughs> Every week we were... Hey, how many were, rushing yards do you have? Eight. It's nice. Yeah, and a first down. That's more Every, than both running backs had. Well... I might, I've got my COVID year left. So, <laughs> you know, every, every week, you know, we would go into coach Rhodes' office and just dump out some sand and then just kind of draw plays of like fakes and stuff. We could run for field goals and kickoffs and punts and Hey, you know, it worked. It did. You know, so how many, t- how many passes do you have too? successful passes? I didn't have any passes. Oh, okay. I, I had, I had an option run versus That's true. you and I. Yeah. Pick up the first I remember down. that one. Coach Road grabbing. You were scared. I was like, no, I wasn't coach. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was yeah, really scared. I was totally scared. In my mind, I saw myself juking the guy and scoring. Then he came. I was like, you're a lot bigger, a lot faster. So I'm going to step out of bounds. <laughs> oh, okay. I got a first down though. Hey, yeah. it counts. Um, but yeah, the, the, the offensive execution on that, it, you pare down what doesn't work, then you add it to what does. But it feels like right now that new batch of 120 plays needs to exist of it might not be like perfect in the next game. If if they do, in fact, go to what everyone I think sort of wants to happen, and it might not like they, you know, option one is get your players to execute better. They might just swap out two guys and uh, tweak a couple things in the middle. And, you know, maybe a guy grades out so poorly, just doesn't see the field anymore. Like that might happen. That very well might happen. But if the option is to redo the scheme to do it and they do open up the field more, there, it might not all work, and it, it probably won't all work. And there are going to be a couple, like you might have a drive that's eight plays, and they go down and they kick a field goal, and then the next drive they go sack, incompletion, sack. Like it might happen, but you you don't know what that's going to look like till you actually get out there. And then you can trim down being like, hey, we can't run, you know, if we're running play action, we can't run play action to Rocco's left because by the time he flips around, 
he's looking too much at the left tackle because he got hit by it and he doesn't really trust that whatever and so we can't run play action this to this side so you know x y and z and you can do you can figure out what doesn't work but to me it feels like what they should do here's me using the word should uh what i would do if i was in the situation of running an offense that performed as poorly as it has for the last two weeks. Campbell's listening, so give him your spiel. For sure. Um, hey, seems like a great guy. Uh, if you want to just toss him the five million my way, I'd be happy. I don't need like a hundred bucks. I just need a new pair of shoes. Um, but if if I'm in the situation of coordinating this offense and f- being free enough to coordinate the offense, it is getting guys like Bramer in formation and guys like Bramer in matchups with safeties and linebackers. It's formationing. Because if Noel catches a lot of stuff over the middle and is able to kind of focus on because he's got the dropsies, but when he does have the ball, he's a really good playmaker. And you got a guy like Higgins who's really good one-on-one. You have some pieces that you can formation into matchups. Find a way to formation into those matchups. And then you can get guys like Sama in a situation where he might be an option route on a middle linebacker because of the formations you've been able to do. You got a tight end to one side. You got Jalen Knowles the other side. They're playing the linebackers out to make sure you don't get any interior stuff. Well, now there's only one linebacker in the middle of the field. Put Sama one-on-one with him or Carson Hansen one-on-one. And like you can formation guys in different matchups and trust that Rocco is going to be able to communicate that and effectively coordinate that, you know, distribute the ball to where they're going to be. So to me, that's the best. That's what I would want to have happen. However, maybe they come out and it looks formationally similar. But the way they go about doing it's going to be different because there will be change. There's no way that a coach comes out and says it was embarrassing and then continue to do the same thing. Dude, how frustrating would it be if we're having this exact same talk next week? It's possible. It's I, I doubt it, but it's possible. And at that point, you you know, I don't know what the, you know, I don't necessarily know if it's like you, uh, you have a come to Jesus, if Jamie has a come to Jesus meeting with Matt and says like, Stuff's got to change, or rather, why is this not changing? Not I'm necessarily a, if, overlooking if it your doesn't, shoulder. I'm gonna tell Dion, hey, walk into Campbell's office right now, <laughs> give him a wet willy and a, salt, and a slap, slap, soft slap, and say, "Hey, what are we doing here, man? Let's go. We gotta change things up here." Didn't you listen to the last podcast? Yeah, he he listens every week, and and Dion would for sure do. Yeah, definitely to yeah. slap his boss. No, I don't think he'll respond. I don't think he do that. That's probably not. Um, I mean, yeah, probably wouldn't say. Yeah, that's probably least of what I'm talking about. But they there is an opportunity. All is not lost. There is the capacity. There is still a ton of talent. I think Rocco's, like I said, Rocco's a dude. You got a bunch of wide receivers. I think the tight end position, it can be successful when put in the position to be successful. It would be is if I'm playing it, me at six foot when I was playing six foot two forty five. If I'm playing a down tight end, like hand on the ground tight end, I'm probably not going to do a very good job. But if I'm an off tight end or playing like H back or whatever, and I get to go out and catch some passes, or I get to go be a third down back and like play on special teams. Those are, those are things that I can succeed in. And so I think that they're going to do a better job, hopefully do a better job of putting guys in situations where they can be successful. But I think now is the time to do it too with, with a young, for sure, young staff, young roster. And we have a lot of talent that is unproven and that is unknown to the rest of, I mean, to fans obviously, but to the big 12, to, to the country. Now is the time to, Okay, we know that Bramer's a stud. We know that Higgins is a stud. We've seen flashes of Sama. I th- I feel like I would say he's trying to get Hanson more involved. We know what, what Noel can do. We know there's talent there. If the offensive line could get their head out of their ass and just kind of open up some lanes, I think we have – I would say it's got the, the, the tools in place. We just got to, yeah, pull the right tool out of the tool belt and, and utilize it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any more juice to squeeze – out of this Ohio game. I mean, I I hope that we look back at this like the Louisiana game from 2020, not like the Kansas game from last year. And it's frustrating because, you know, as we've talked about, the standard has been raised and, you know, expectations are we, we win. We don't, we don't have back-to-back down years. But mm-hmm. unfortunately, you know, the spot that Iowa State's in with the gambling and, you know, some of the some of the guys that have, have, have graduated and have transferred out, unfortunately, that's that's where things are at, is that we are in another rebuilding year and could be a long year. Or if you get things fixed and you were able to execute it and you put your guys in positions to succeed, might not be. You know, ten, the, the, ten wins is still possible. Technically, technically, I think you're a little rosy. Nine. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, I, we don't have an interview uh, this week. We tried. We really reached out. To <laughs> I mean, I mean, dude, I was zero for six. Shot for the moon. So we had we had one, and then just hello, still coming or no? Uh, we did try and reach out to Brandon Whedon. I yep. reached out to Barry Sanders' son. I'm somehow friends with him on Facebook. It's like, hey, basically, hey, does your dad want to join us? No response. Also try to get Quinn Sharp on. No response. He's probably still bitter about yeah. 2011. It was 12 years ago, man. Let it go. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I didn't even, I didn't even <laughs> talk to him. So I'm not sure if that's how he feels or not. Uh, but yeah, we tried to get some. But I don't know. We'll, we'll still try and uh, effort into the next couple of I'm, weeks. I'm realizing now that these, and no offense to our, you know, our guests from, from one through three, higher profile guests, you might need to reach out to them sooner than. A little sooner than. Yeah, so I'm trying to reach out to some. For down the road. For down the road. Um, well, I do want to touch on Oklahoma State just just for a minute. We, we kind of did, and obviously that's, that's our next opponent, and that's Iowa State's next opponent. Um, so let's, let's have this segment be sponsored by Goldfinch Athletics. Goldfinch Athletics, uh, if you're looking for youth speed performance, if you're looking for adult fitness, all that be goldfinchathletics.com. We did actually have some really cool thing. We got a contract. Now, if you're a, if you're a, if you have a kid in the Des Moines public school district, we actually just got a contract with the Des Moines public schools to be able to provide our rookies program, which is our youth uh, elementary school program about teaching kids to understand and really like exercise to teach them how to move properly, uh, with the DMPS schools. We're still working on a location and times specifically, but if you're in if you have a, a, a elementary school kid or a junior high kid and you are in the Des Moines Public School District, look out for a it'd be Goldfinch Speed, and that's going to be coming to you at some point in October once we get the logistics nailed down. So that's a cool thing. I'm really really excited about it because the it's a nonprofit that works with the district to be able to provide opportunities for kids that they otherwise wouldn't get. Because if you have wealthy kids that live in the suburbs and they can afford to go to a facility like ours, but a lot of the kids that live in the Des Moines District don't have that kind of money. So it's a nonprofit that's able to provide services like ours to them. And so I'm really excited about the good to be able to do with that program. So look, be on the lookout if you're in the Des Moines Public School District. If you are another school district that is looking for ways to get your kids more, the elementary school kids or junior high kids, or even up to high school kids that are more, ex, more excited into training or more effective into training, um, goldfinchathletics.com. Check out the website. Uh, that is, I don't know, that's great joy being able to provide it to young kids. Anyway, back to Oklahoma State. So we didn't have an interview, so Goldfinch Athletics is sponsoring the Oklahoma State segment. Well, I kind of want to call this segment just Grant's random thoughts. I'm down. <laughs> so, I'm also scared. Yeah, no, we should be. Um, I'll first talk about Oklahoma State, though. Um, we talked about. It. I don't. They're not very good. They've they've got two wins. Um, one of them is against Central Arkansas, who beat a team seventy to two. But they're one and two. Okay. And then they beat um, Arizona State, starting a true freshman, not very good. And then they just got blasted, just blasted by, by USA. South. By USA, South USA. Uh, by South you, you know, ba- you know uh, Banger up, coached at USA. Now he's sure at did. Abilene Christian, but he was the old line coach at USA. He went from USA to I think Virginia Tech. He was from Virginia Tech to USA, to USA, and then from USA to Abilene Christian. That doesn't seem like the right trajectory. <laughs> the, the the staff got let go. Oh, okay. Um, but I don't think they're very good. They they've you know Oklahoma State has they they rotate three quarterbacks. We talked about them. I think Alan Bowman is their starter. He's the one that has the most stats. He started at Texas Tech. Was really good as a freshman. Decent stats as a sophomore, and then a ju- this is his sixth year, so I'm not sure what 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 the his first year he was good, second year he was okay, third year he was decent, and then he went to Michigan for fourth and fifth year, um, had 11 attempts, didn't do anything. Then he's come back here to Oklahoma. He's back in Big 12, Oklahoma State. Hasn't really done anything. He's thrown one pick, no no touchdowns. Stats aren't very good. Um, they don't really have any, which I feel like is very un Oklahoma state. Like they don't really have like a proven wide receiver, like a, like a stud wide receiver or tailback or tailback. Uh, Ollie Oliver Gordon, I think is their starting running back. Um, younger guy, Iowa state was hard on him. I know. Um, he's, I think they're starting running back. Um, their defense isn't very good. I mean, they're middle of the road. Like they're 68th out of out of 130. So, so side note about that. I think Jim Knowles was the defensive coordinator. I mean, I might be getting the name wrong, but I think Jim Knowles was the defensive coordinator the year they went to and lost the big 12 championship game to Baylor. Yeah. And then went to, then he went to Ohio state State the year afterwards. And since then the defense has taken substantial steps back and Ohio (laughs) state's defense has gotten substantially better. So Jim Knowles was there and they also had uh, going from that championship year to the next year, they had nine seniors leave that roster on the defensive side into last year, and they still haven't picked up from that. They also had Arlen Bruce, who was the ah, yeah. wide receiver at Iowa, Good who pull. bet the under in a Northwestern Iowa game. 
And it was one of the games they actually went over. So he bet against his own offense and lost, which was, again, just... Smart bet, bad beat, bad move for being an athlete. <laughs> not, not a great series of events. But anyway, he's now ineligible. So he's they're somewhat tied into this thing. But that they were I think they were counting on him to be able to got, be a guy in the middle to... You know, he's a good player to be able to kind of free up some space in the middle. So... Yeah, they got three quarterbacks, which means you have zero quarterbacks, and you've got no dominant wide receivers because the guy that you were planning on being your dominant wide receiver is basically kicked out of the NCAA now, and you got a running back who's a freshman. So there's your offense. Yeah, and and their quarterbacks, Alan Bowman is a six year senior. The dude is twenty seven. Not really, I don't know how old he is, but he's old. Sixty three. Yep. Bill Snyder back there, and um, you got Gunnar Gundy. Gunnar Gundy. Again, Woodrow Woody. Yeah. So that's head coach's son which is he any good i don't know he's head coach's son so get out there kid you know mccaffrey and then there's random thoughts man and then there's (laughs) the the true freshman garrett wrangle or something i think he's a true freshman he's a freshman that's such a southern name yeah that's such an oklahoma garrett wrangle yeah he wears a big old belt buckle too and some shit kickers (laughs) (laughs) um None of their stats are very good. So this is going to be a pillow fight. If, you, if you're a betting man, take the under. under over under is 36 right now. Iowa State's favored by three and a half, which if we can start 1-0 in Big 12, let's do it. I don't care. It Win it three to zero. Doesn't, it, but please have some type of offensive execution that doesn't make me mad. Yeah. Um, so that's it, Oklahoma State. It's going to be a pillow fight, but I'm here for it. Um, second thought. I'm I'm still on the Perkins All American uh, bandwagon train. I'm I'm the hype train. I'm I'm the conductor. Hey, the, co- the the color guy for the game. Choo choo. That is a uh, best punter. My, one of the best punters in America. He is. His he, name's getting out there, man. He had a long of 51. Four of his five punts were inside the 20. And one of them was just a butte, just rolled out at like the seven. Yeah, he's having. He is. He is. He is our most consistent. Tampa's pretty good. He's Tampa, our. Mo- he's Tampa's our most consistent. Good. Cooper's pretty good. Um, Cooper kind of got exposed a little bit in the game, though. Expo- he gave up like one completion, dude. Number twelve, number twelve, man. He had Cooper he looking for his jock on the field. Um, he had like four catches on eleven targets. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. And he had one of them. One of those catches, the touchdown catch, was because it wasn't being covered by Cooper. It was a blown coverage, and then he about died because <laughs> maybe just because I saw the skinny little white dude <laughs> scooting around. I was like, "Who's this guy?" It's because they threw it at him like sixty-four times. I mean, blind squirrel finds nut. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then my, my last, my last, um, random thought here, our guy, our guy, Brent Bloom, AKA Blake Groupie. Hey, big pull from way back for the, for the loyal listeners from week one. The dude is the starting kicker for the saints three for three with a long of 52. He's playing tonight, Monday night football. Hey, body stats here, height and weight. Um, five, seven, one fifty six. He might be heavier than Bloom. Pro athlete. That's literally me running out there. Five seven. I might be five eight. Sixty five. You kind of, you kind of look like it. To be <laughs> honest, are you Blake? <laughs> so he's he's three for three. Um, yeah. What if what if in the time between recording this and editing this, he goes out and misses like six kicks? Um, you know what? Not sorry about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. I think we have. Uh, hopefully, we've exhausted both the negative energy and given some positive energy for the next week. So uh, stay tuned for more content this week from Cyclone Fanatic. It will, this too shall pass. The night is dark is poor, the dawn, but all that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, we'll be back next week, hopefully talking about the first Big 12 win of the season, but who knows? All right, thanks everybody. Yeah, and if you're still listening, we really appreciate your loyalty and adopt, don't shop. <laughs>